Hi guys, welcome back to the Earthy Delights podcast. We hope you've had a great Christmas and you're looking forward to the new year. For our first podcast, we've got a really special guest, Richard Moore. Richard Moore grew up in Derry, Northern Ireland, and as a child, grew up during the Troubles and was shot by a British soldier, losing his right eye and becoming blind in his left eye. This is his story about forgiveness. I hope you enjoy. Richard Moore, welcome to the Earthly Delights podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Good to meet both of you. No, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, first, first and foremost, we have to ask, or we want to ask, what's the crack with you? <laughs> well, the crack's good at the minute. Um, I suppose um, it's it, it, we're living in a, a kind of a, a world at the minute that's sort of changing almost by the minute between um, between the whole COVID and the impact of that on our daily lives. And then, of course, um, Brexit is not far away as well. And living here where I live in Derry in Northern Ireland, then, you know, the Brexit is very significant because we live on the border to the Republic of Ireland and it's very topical here. And then, of course, how the COVID's impacting and all our lives uh, in terms of your, your own personal social side of your life and then obviously your working life as well. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been quite a challenging time in terms of sort of trying to keep on top of everything um, mm. whilst, whilst looking after yourself in the middle of it all. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I, I know you're a very social man, Richard. Has it been particularly difficult for you given the, the recent restrictions? Yes, it has. Um, there's been kind of, you know, positives and minuses about it, um, or positive and negatives. Um, you know, in some ways, um, you know, I never ever imagined that I could work from home. I'm one of these people that, you know, likes to get up in the morning, get out, go to work, and, you know, have that sense of purpose uh, in that way, getting up, leaving the house and going to work. And I've always said, I can't understand how people work from home, mm. but I found myself working from home. The first week or two, I have to say, it was a significant sort of mental adjustment. Yeah. Um, and uh, the only way that I could tackle it was by imposing a routine on myself. Mm. And, you know, uh, so I, I that's how I worked from home. But I found myself after a couple of weeks you know, actually almost enjoying it. I'll not say entirely enjoyed it, but I could say that I I, I I did begin to relax into it. And then socially, you know, I do socialize quite a bit. I love travel absolutely I love all the things people hate. I love airplanes, I love airports, I love buses and trains and <laughs> I love go going places, you know. And for me a part of going anywhere is the journey. You know, I love the journey. I love from the moment I get the taxi from the house or get a lift and uh, go on the train and all of that. So all those things I enjoy, and they all suddenly stopped. Going out for a bite to eat, going out for a a pint. You know, um, going to um, you know traveling. You know, I probably travel normally around three or four months a year. So uh, with work and between work and holidays and leisurely things so all of those things all stopped suddenly and um, I do still miss all that you know yeah um I mean I, I think we all do but it was quite philosophical that you love the journey almost more than the destination I feel like we could take that into all of our lives um ah, that's true I mean to me <laughs> to me I I from the minute I step out to the work that's my journey started and I love every element of it and I suppose for a blind person you know, um, I don't know if it is the case, but maybe I just sometimes think it is that, especially when I travel on my own, that I get to engage with people on a one-to-one -one basis, um, and I love that opportunity. Whereas if I travel with somebody, mm -hmm. then uh, you don't get to engage in the same way. So I, I, I love that as well. Brilliant, brilliant, Richard. I wondered before we get into um, the the. Uh, hard questions. Could you just start telling us about yourself or maybe anyone who isn't familiar with you and your story? Okay, well, um, my name is Richard Moore and uh, I come from a place called Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, 
I've lived here all my life. I'm 59 years of age now, so I was born in 1961. And I grew up in a, a sort of a housing area called the Craigan Estate. That was an area of social housing. And I, 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 I grew up there. And around um, 1968, 69, what was a peaceful place to live became a violent place to live. It was at the epicenter of the Northern Ireland conflict. Shootings, riots, bombings became almost a daily occurrence. And um, outside our front door, for example, all the pavements were dug up and broken up and used as missiles to throw at the British Army or the police or they build barricades at the end of each street. So you would have had these barricades, you know, a, a big housing area of around 15,000 people, and you would have had barricades at the end of each street made out of the broken rubble, or, you know, hijacked vehicles like buses, trucks, cars. They were hijacked, put across the road, and burned, and cemented under these barricades. So the it seemed like overnight to me all that began to happen. And um, and then um, the Craigan and the Bogside, which, who were, which were beside each other, became what was officially known as a no-go area. And that basically meant the British Army and the police weren't welcome into those areas. So the barricades were built to prevent the military or the police from infiltrating the area easily. And um, then in January 72, you had Bloody Sunday. Mm. It happened on the streets of the Bogside and um, 13 people were killed by the British Army during a, who, people who had attended a, a protest march. You know, most of my family were on that march. Um, my my uncle, Jared, was shot dead that day, my mother's brother. And then, you know, at least, you know, four or five of the people who were shot dead that day lived within 30 seconds walk of my house. Mm. So the Craigan, the Bogside, Derry, Northern Ireland, became a very volatile place. And the weeks and months that followed, 1972 was probably one of the most violent years of the Northern Ireland conflict. And um, I think it's down to Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday kicked off the worst year of violence in Northern Ireland. My school was Rosemount Primary School, and Rosemount Primary School was on the edge of the Craigan. And beside the school was a police station. So here you had a police station at the edge of a no-go area, an area that was patrolled mainly by the IRA. And our school was right beside it. So the police station was a target for the IRA and target for rioters on a daily basis. On the 4th of May 1972, I got out of school as normal. And me and my friends were racing along the bottom of the school soccer pitch. I was only 10 years of age at the time. And there was a British Army lookout post positioned at the bottom of the school uh, football pitch. And that, the Army were there to protect the police station. And as I ran past that Army lookout post, a British soldier fired a rubber bullet. I was 10 feet away. It hit me in the bridge of the nose. And um, I lost my right eye and was permanently blinded on my left eye. So I've been blind now 48 years. And, um, I, I, and you know, my life since then has been, you know, uh, really very rich in many ways. You know, um, I responded quite positively to blindness and being shot. I bounced back very well. 
and I eventually went back to my primary school, then went on to the the secondary school, went to university, got my degree. Uh, I got married in 1984. I have two children, Neve and Enya. Neve's 30 years of age now, Enya's 28. And um, I did a lot of things after I was shot. I I, um, I was compensated by the British government. And with half the money, I bought a house. And with the other half, half, I bought a pub. And then I bought a second pub. So by the time I was 20 years of age, I owned two pubs in the centre of Derry. So when I come out of university, I went straight into run my own business. I had a pub, an office above one of the pubs. And I, went, I ran my own business for about 14 years. I um, also learned how to play the guitar. And I, you know, set up a folk choir that sing at uh, church every Saturday night. That's about 20 female singers and a couple of musicians. And, um, you know, I I um, had a recording studio and stuff like that. I had a great interest in football. I became a director of Derry City Football Club for a couple of years. And, um, and as you know, Derry City is the biggest club on the planet, so it's great <laughs> to be there. And, um, you know, I... Uh, I um I suppose um I I would attribute my ability to bounce back from being shot and blinded. Uh you know, and such a I bounce back in such a positive way and I would attribute that to the fact that I come from a good family, the fact that I come from a good community. And um the fact that I was able to go back to school and get an education for myself. So um, it was that factor that influenced me to eventually um, uh, sell out, you know, it was that fa- factor that eventually, you know, encouraged me to kind of sell out the business and set up an organization called Children in Crossfire. Because I realized that every child given the right support, every child given the right opportunity in life, no matter how difficult it may seem, can bounce back and grow and blossom and contribute in a positive way to the lives, to their own life and to the lives of others. So I set up Children in Crossfire in 1996. And today... That's the organization that I run. I'm speaking to you from the Children in Crossfire office. And, um, you know, we're going almost 25 years now. And we work in Tanzania and Ethiopia, supporting projects that provide access to preschool education for children or provide access to food and water, clean water and things like that, health issues. And as well as that, we work in Ireland. We do work in Ireland you know, through training teachers on methods that they can use in the classroom to get young people to engage with local issues like, you know, like the conflict and also how they respond to issues like poverty and stuff like that and to get children to engage with that type of thing. So that's my story, as brief as I can make it. (laughs) Thanks for that, Richard. I, I really have so many questions um, but the first question that I'd like to ask is, is there someone that you could attribute to like being your inspiration um, after you were shot or growing up? Um, because you mentioned, obviously, the, the family was, was huge for you, the family unit, the community mm, unit. Yeah. But I can also imagine that there was a lot of um, anger in, in Derry in the community at the time. And perhaps if you were maybe surrounded by um, certain people that – like held on to this anger rather than what you did um that that perhaps uh, i'm I'm interested to know if you think perhaps you would have responded differently if you didn't have uh, such uh, an environment around you Um, and i'm I'm sorry if i don't know if i mentioned making this clear yeah no i get it um yeah i i think that 
you know, there's, I suppose there's different people come that influence your life or come into your life at different times. And um, I think, you know, I, I should have mentioned that the one significant thing about my story is that I've never had any anger or any hatred or bitterness towards a soldier or towards a British army. And I think that was very important. And my ability to not only adjust to blindness and accept blindness, but also to, um, and my ability to kind of move on in a very happy and contented way. And I am a very happy and contented person. I don't mind being blind. I quite enjoy being blind sometimes. And I always say that I, I can't separate the good things in my life from blindness itself. Now, why is that? I think my parents were remarkable. You know, I just, every day I am grateful and thankful that I had the parents I had. I was totally and utterly blessed. My parents were like, my daddy was an unemployed shoemaker. My mother was what you would describe in modern times now as a, a homemaker. They had 12 children. I was the second youngest, nine boys in three years. They were living in poverty, basically, like a lot of families throughout Ireland. And, um, but what we were rich in was love. Our family, our parents, they were, they weren't, they didn't pontificate, they didn't give speeches, they didn't, they were just ordinary, everyday people that just kept a lovely, warm home. We wanted for nothing. We had everything we needed. And they were always there. But despite my mother's brother being murdered by the British Army and me being blinded by the British Army, all in the space of a few months, and all the injustice and the pain and the hurt that comes with all of that. I never heard him say an angry word. And in fact, I've heard him say the opposite. And, you know, I think that if I need to look to a hero or heroes, it's right there in my parents. The role that they played in my life was enormous. And, you know, my family reduced the impact of blindness. So why am I positive about blindness? Because blindness didn't have that big of a negative impact on my life. Why is that? Because my family and my friends and my community made sure that any obstacles that were presented in my life were removed as much as possible. And then that whole sort of quiet message of forgiveness. I reckon my parents would never have described it in that manner, but I reckon they were really compassionate people. And they showed that every day of their lives. And for some reason, it just penetrated me. Mm. And I didn't know that either. So if I'm to have a hero, that's, you know, they're, those two are certainly the people that, they are the rock that I stand on. You know, they're the people that inspire me every day in terms of how I am with my children, how we should be with each other, and how we should lead our lives. And, you know, one of the things that I realized from that is the significant role that you and me play in the lives of others. You know, like, I was able to forgive the British soldier, I think, because my parents forgave the British soldier. I didn't have any anger because my parents didn't have any anger. Say I had been living in a home where my parents were 
angry, talking about revenge, talking about locking up the soldier and throwing away the key. And we have to get our own back. I remember one time, one of my brothers, who was about 17 at the time, and I was just out of hospital a month or so, and I was sitting in our living room. And because the house was a small house, I could hear the conversation in the kitchen. And my mother was out there, and my brother was having a real go at her. And he was saying, and very colourful language that I won't use now, <laughs> but he was saying things like, they murdered my Uncle Jared. They blinded Richard. It's time to give her own back. Forget about anything else. We need to give her own back on them. And my mother said to him, if you want to help Richard, go on there to that room and help Richard. But you're not helping Richard by hurting somebody else. Mm. And that was the messages. That was the, it was almost like the atmosphere in our house. You were surrounded in this bubble of love, compassion, and forgiveness that that was just there. And it obviously penetrated me. And so I've realized that the role that I play in relation to my children, the role that I play in everything I say, the people listening to this podcast, I realize that people come to a podcast like this for different reasons. They could be struggling. They could be interested in learning something. They could be vulnerable. They could be hurt. So I'm very aware that, you know, that what I see is hopefully having a positive impact on their next step, on their next thought. So I could be on here saying, hell will never be full until every British soldier is locked up. Hell will never be full until the soldier that blinded me pays for what he did to me. And I will never forgive the man that did it. I don't think I'd be helping anybody else by adopting that attitude. I certainly wouldn't be helping myself. And that's my view. Now, I understand that forgiveness is hard. And I think sometimes we expect too much from victims. We expect victims to lead the way. You know, mm. show us forgiveness. Show us, the, you know, how to go forward. And it's not fair to expect that from a victim. But at the same time, what I would say is, look, wherever a victim can and has the strength to do that, then it's a message worth hearing and it's a message worth sharing. Because if I am contented with blindness, if I am happy with blindness, I attribute it quite a bit to the lack of anger and the presence of forgiveness in my life. But you're asking about heroes and, you know, I mean... Derry lost someone in the last few months, John Hume. And John Hume is one of my heroes. And why is he one of my heroes? Because one, he grew up 10 minutes walk from my house. He was just an ordinary Derry man living in extraordinary circumstances. And he used every fibre in his body to achieve peace through peaceful means. And he was successful. And he was under a lot of pressure, a lot of criticism. You know, sometimes the winds that blew towards him were very strong, but he held his conviction 
and what and what he the the for me is a hero that came from very humble beginnings and achieved an enormous amount. And it's an example of one, what one person can do. So no matter how small you are, then, you know, you can achieve a lot. And then, of course, you have people like the Dalai Lama. Your who friend. I, which he's alive at the privilege of meeting and all that stuff. And I, I sometimes, I'm afraid to say it because it sounds like, you know, you know, your your name dropping. <laughs> you know, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty a, nice a, name drop. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, that's a top trump there. I don't think most people are going to do that one. Well, it, it's like somebody said to me, well, the, you know, I said to my friend, the Dalai Lama, you know, people think I'm always name dropping. <laughs> 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 but uh, but I, I am lucky, privileged. Oh, my God. You know, they, they have... They have met the Dalai Lama and to be close to the Dalai Lama and they've had the access to him that I've had since I've met him. But, like, look at his story. You know, you know, like, I had to leave home in exile back in 1959, travelled over the Himalayas, I think, and they ended up living in exile. And look at the example that he has given his people over, over many years, what, 50, 60 years um, more and uh, you know in the face of all sorts of provocation, but he's always managed to maintain this message of peace and the peaceful approach. And you know, and uh, he comes under a lot of pressure too. So there's and there's different heroes in your life that you come across. And um, my parents are obviously first and foremost. John Hume and people like the Dalai Lama are, for me, some of the heroes that I would try to look up to and live up to. That's, I mean, that's beautiful, Richard. And we've got a question here, which um, kind of comes at odds somewhat with what you've just said, because it's clear uh, from what you've just said that you're very proud of where you've come from your community your family but uh, Jim and I are really interested in the idea of identity and how it informs our behaviors how it informs our feelings and our thoughts for example I mean my British accent I don't think has ever been more pronounced than being on a podcast with a Dublin man and a dairy man so <laughs> um, well not hold it against you sorry. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when you know truth be told is that when researching your story and everything else and obviously now talking to you being an Englishman I mean half Englishman I'll say that but being an Englishman it um you know I sometimes I feel a bit embarrassed and a bit disgusted with what we did even though obviously it wasn't me personally and I wondered whether you because obviously there's a lot of hurt in, in not just in Northern Ireland we've, I spoke about with Jim before in Ireland we I get it's good crack but you know you get the little um the jokes here and there about me being an Englishman and so on and so forth. And you can still feel there's some, there's some sentiment there. Um, and I wondered if you felt at all that it was ever necessary to somewhat disconnect with, um, your Northern Irish or your Derry, um, identity to be able to find it within you to number one, not have any anger. And then more than that, to actually look for the British soldier, forgive him and then hold no ill will to Brit the British army. And then the British people in general, someone like myself, do you think there's any credence to that thought or, or was that not the case in, in, in your particular circumstance? Uh, no, I think that um, I think your identity is very important. Know who you are, where you're from. It's a it's a it's a way of grounding you and, and you're you know giving you a sense of belonging. Mm. Um, but you know, as the world evolves, like I remember just to, to talk about the Dalai Lama, for example. You know, and and, and one time I, I I remember somebody asking him about you know where you know where his home is in many ways. And it, it, it would have, I think he said something like, my home is the planet. You know, this is my home. And uh, so, in other words, everybody, everybody, whether you be in India, Tibet, Ireland, Europe, America, whatever, they, by, by virtue of the word being your home, then all of those people are your family in many ways. Mm -hmm. Now, that might sound a bit sort of, airy, fairy, or flowery, but it's it's actually when you unpack it, it, it is means much more than that. 
I, I don't think you can hold a nation responsible for what some other people do, what their politicians do. Politicians all over the world make awful decisions and make selfish decisions and make wrong decisions. And, you know, many ways they lack empathy and compassion and stuff like that. And they make decisions for the wrong reasons. Um, so whether you're Irish, whether you're British or American, as much as we like to poke fun at you, um, the bottom line is that every nation in the world has carried their embarrassments or carried out their acts of, you know, atrocity or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and like in Northern Ireland, for example, I come from the nationalist Catholic community. And there were, you know, obviously organizations that emerged out of the conflict here that carried out awful atrocities in our name. And that happened on both sides of the conflict here. And, you know, I think that in many ways you have to try to rationalize that. You have to try to understand that. And you have to be realistic as well. We live in a world where people do respond and people do, um, you know, feel that the only way to um, deal with a, an injustice is by creating another injustice. No, it isn't the answer. It's the wrong answer. But um, that's what some people do. And, uh, uh, you know, I think what we've got to do is try to come up with a, a new way. We kind of reprogram people in some ways. And it's probably got to start in our education almost. You know, that, you know, um, I suppose using the example of the British soldier, Charles fired a British a rubber bullet at me at a group of children. There's no justification for that. It's unjustifiable. Uh, for a soldier to fire a rubber bullet at a group of children under any circumstances that can't be explained away but is Charles a bad person no he's not he's actually a nice person and you know so there's some way in some ways you have to separate the action from the actor and if you can do that, then it gives you maybe the opportunity to get beyond the incident, beyond the hurt. And I think in a sort of national sense or a community sense, I think it's really painful and awful what people have done. But if we're, if we're to move forward in some kind of positive way, you've got to get beyond that Um, and that's where I think if we can begin to educate children on how to respond uh, and again His Holiness talks about that about the the need for um, educating the heart that we've got to begin to respond maybe with compassion with empathy uh, and the hardest part time to do that is when you're responding to someone who's hurt you, yeah. When you or cause pain. So if you can do that, the way to do it is by seeing past the incident. So if I respond to charge blinding me and firing a rubber bullet, that's one kind of position that you're responding to. But if you can respond to the person and try to understand. That all right, what you did was wrong. But I want to get to know you as a person. I want to understand you as a person. Because behind that rubber bullet gun, behind the uniform, is a human being. And it's not easy. And some people could be listening to this, listen to this saying, you know, is he for real? But I've done it. I've done it. And I'm very fond of the soldier that blinded me. I consider him a good friend. 
and he's not a bad person, but he did a bad thing. So in terms of identity and trying to go back to what you're asking me, then I think you should be very proud of those positive things in your culture, in your community, in your nation, and also acknowledge the not-so-nice things that exist there. But try to find a way that you can learn from it and move on from it. And, and don't allow the negative things the, that your nation's done, that your, your, your tribe is responsible for, to influence how you go forward in a negative way. But they learn from all of that. And that's the only thing that I can say. I think identity is very important. But I think if you identify with the good things in your uh, your nation, then that's going to be more valuable in the long term. Following on, Richard, um, it's actually your friend, the Dalai Lama, I believe, who said that forgiveness is a gift to yourself. And I wanted your opinion on whether you think that people underestimate this potential gift to themselves. Yes, I mean, God, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I suppose, you know, what, what, what do I think the Dalai Lama means by that? What do I think the Dalai Lama means by that? And what, how does it play itself out in my life? I totally agree with what he says, and I, I, I've experienced it. Um, at the end of the day, look, um, you know, the whole emotion of anger, the whole emotion of bitterness has a negative effect on you. It, it, it has a negative impact on your happiness, and I'm sure it has an, a negative impact on your health, your physical health. And... You know, if you ever look at an angry person or if you ever even think about when you're angry yourself, do you like that? Do you like what you see in yourself? Do you like what you see in other people? Is it a happy place to be? And the reality is it isn't. And how often have you got angry or I've got angry where even when the anger subsides that you actually feel bad about yourself? that has affected your mood, it's affected, you know, the rest of your day because you've responded with anger to somebody or something. And it, 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 it just had that sort of, put that sort of cloud over your day. Whereas when you um, find forgiveness, then you're finding a way that you can deal with the hurt and pain that you've experienced, but move on. And you're feeling happier because of that. Um, you know, everybody wants to be happy, I think. And, you know, what, what is happiness at the end of the day? Is it having a bigger car? Is it having a bigger house? Is it having more holidays or more money? And all those things, I suppose, have their place in your life. But you can have all those things, but you may not be happy. And one of the areas for me that, that contribute certainly to my happiness is the fact that um, I forgive the soldier. I feel good about the fact that I forgive the soldier. I don't have that emotion of anger and hatred within me. So I feel good about that as well. And that to me contributes enormously to the happy person that I am. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. No, that, that was great, Richard. Um, I also wanted to ask you, on whether you've been able to maybe facilitate this um, forgiveness in in your friends who maybe might be holding some sort of uh, anger yeah. or bitterness within them. 
Hi. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't like to give myself the credit of sort of um, changing people's minds or whatever, but mm-hmm. I have I, the reason why I share my story so much is because I think I'm blessed. I think I'm blessed with my family. I think I'm blessed with even blindness. And I'm blessed with the gift of forgiveness. You know, um, there's two things I would say about forgiveness. One you've already mentioned. Forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. Think of the benefits that you're getting from just forgiving somebody. You know, it is just an amazing experience. But as well as that, the second thing is, you know, forgiveness doesn't change the past. It's not, the fact that I forgive Charles isn't going to give me back my eyesight. The fact that I forgive Charles isn't going to take away all that hurt and pain that me and my family experienced all that time, all those years ago. But it does change the future. So forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does change your future and how you can go forward. So, I mean, I have shared my story with quite a few people. And I'm receiving letters, I receive, and people come to me afterwards. I remember one time I was speaking at a thing in in a... America was and a, a church in America, and um, this seventy-eight-year-old woman came up to me after it and said, "I haven't spoke to my sister in forty years, and when I go home tonight, I'm going to phone her. I've always held a grudge, and tonight." I'm going to give her a call. And to me, that made it all worthwhile. Mm. No, I don't know what transpired since that. Um, But I've met many people over the years that have written to me and have said to me that, you know, that they were able to let go of an anger that they felt because of what I said. Um, You know, so, uh, you know, and, and, uh, so I, I never underestimate the power of the story. And I'm, I would be quietly confident that I think it does, you know, plant a seed for people to develop or nurture or grow. And I do think we all need, you know, like a seed that needs to be nurtured, needs to be watered, needs nourishment. And I think those, when the seed is planted, then what people need is constant nourishment and messages of forgiveness and support and moving forward like that. You know, um, so I, I, I would hope that I have influenced people, but not because I want the credit of it, because I think they would be happier because of it. And I also think, look, if we're to build a world that we all want to live in, which is peaceful, then we want to live together. You know, that's the reality. The reality is there are people who are different from us. There are people who will hurt us sometimes. And um, there are difficult circumstances uh, that we all live in. But ultimately, if we want to live in peace, we've got to try to find a way that we can do that. And um, I think that if we're to have true reconciliation in our lives, then it's got to start with yourself. Forget about the other person. It's got to start with you. Uh, and it's, 
There's no better place for that to start than in your own heart. And the gift of forgiveness is an avenue through which you can begin that process. And like, I forgave Charles before I ever met him. I don't need to meet somebody to forgive them. I don't need to meet somebody to reconcile with them. You know, so it's it's very possible. You know, uh, and like, um, like, for example, the British Army never apologized for what happened to me. And the soldier, even when I met Charles, he didn't apologize. And if you had asked him, are you sorry? He would have said, no, I haven't been asked to apologize, nor do I feel I need to apologize. And he held that position for about six years after I met him, and we met all regularly. And I, and I remember one time somebody saying to me that they wouldn't have met the soldier unless he apologized. Well, you know, if I hadn't have met Charles, then a relationship wouldn't have had the chance to grow. Six years after I met Charles, one night in Derry here, he apologized. Six years later. And there's a couple of lessons in that, but the one thing that I did learn, that, you know, if I had have insisted that I have an apology, that he said sorry, that would have given Charles a key to a chamber in my heart, in my head, that only he could open. And instead, all my doors were open. I didn't need Charles to release anything for me. And by meeting Charles without any preconditions, I allowed him, hopefully, to begin a journey. A journey of dealing with what he did. And to maybe in some way challenge himself. And ultimately, what happened? He said, sorry. Hmm. Was never asked for. Never insisted upon. He arrived at that point himself. So, again, you know, sometimes if you're genuine about reconciliation or you're genuine about trying to, you know, find peace in your life, then the way to do that is through reconciliation, as I said. But what you've got to understand is you can't meet the person that you would like that person to be. You've got to allow them to be who they are. They've got to be allowed to live in their space and be the person that they are. Equally, you've got to be allowed to live in your space and be the person that you are. So when you accept that, there's a brilliant freedom in that. But when you accept that, then that allows the relationship to develop whatever way it develops. And, you know, me and Charles are two complete strangers, really. He's a military man. Our lives would never really meet. We would have very little in common in terms of the trajectory of our lives. His whole life has been military. Has 600 years of military history in his family. And I, my family is very different. But at least through the process that I've just outlined, there was a, a conversation that was able to begin. And I discovered, which seems obvious now, that he was a father, he was a grandfather, he loved his children, he loved his wife, he loved his parents, and he was just a normal human being 
they'd done something terrible. Um, and through the process that we embarked upon, we were able to get past the incident. Richard, do you, um, before we move on to to another topic, the last question on yeah. forgiveness, I wonder if when you kind of embarked on this journey um, and maybe you told your friends or your community that you had number one forgiven um, Charles and then you were then going to actually seek him out and, and befriend him, did you have anyone who... I don't know, don't want to use the word traitor, but who almost saw you couldn't understand what you were doing, thought that you, you know, couldn't understand the path that you were going on, and and, and was very against it. Or was everybody very supportive in in the fact that you were trying to forgive someone who, when you hear the story, unless you're someone as compassionate as you are, it is hard to imagine yourself to get to such a place where you'd want to forgive a man who robbed you of your sight at the age of 10 or 11. How, how were you, how was your community in when they found out your decision to try to forgive this man? Yeah, well, I, I've never experienced any sort of real strong uh, resistance at all to me right. wanting to meet the soldier. What I did experience was some people saying, that um, fair play to Richard, but I I couldn't do or I wouldn't do what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, the the person that probably would have worried about letting others down most was me. I in my mind I was very conscious of other victims of the Troubles, especially victims of British Army violence. And I can remember when I got to know Charles' name and all sorts of emotions come in then, things that I never thought I had. I felt weepy. I felt nerves in my stomach, anxiety, you know. Like, I never had any of those feelings before that point. But I also become very aware that Am I betraying my own community? Am I betraying those people who have been so badly hurt by the British Army from my own side of the community? And I did have those thoughts. And uh, I remember one morning I was getting ready to go to work and I heard an interview on the radio with a man called Alan McBride. And Alan's wife was killed in the shackle bomb in Belfast. But Alan was on the radio. I think he was invited to speak at some event. But he was talking about being willing to meet Jerry Adams. And Jerry Adams at that time was the leader of Sinn Féin and was, you know, heavily associated with the IRA, let's say. Mm-hmm. The people that caused the death of his wife. But there would have been people from his own community who would have thought what he was doing was paramount to treason. You know? Yeah. But he was doing it because... It was what he wanted to do. And I remember thinking, you know what, Richard? You have to do what you want to do yourself. You have to follow your own convictions. So what was important to me that I didn't re-traumatize my my mother. My daddy was dead. He died in 1978, so he was long dead by the time I got to know the British soldier's name. But my mother was... Uh, in her late 80s and was still very much alive and and clued into what was happening. And I didn't want to traumatise her. I didn't want to traumatise any members of my family. So all along the process, I kept them updated. But I met Charles on a Saturday for the first time. And on the Friday morning, I went to my daddy's grave and I just said, look, Daddy, I hope you're happy. 
with what I'm doing. And then in the afternoon, I went down to see my mother. And I said, well, Mommy, you know, it's tomorrow. Now I'm going to meet the soldier. And she said to me, would I be all right? And I said, I would. And I said, Mommy, you know, sometime I may bring the soldier back to Derry to meet you. And she said, Richard, if you're happy, I'm happy. Mm. And I think as she had said then, I don't want you doing this for some reason. I couldn't have done it because I couldn't have hurt her any more than what she had been hurt over the years. So I've never really experienced any strong rejection to what I did. I maybe experienced people saying that they couldn't do it. But Richard, it's okay if you do it. And to be honest, this community has been nothing but supportive of everything I did. And meeting the soldier, you know, I get constant encouragement from people that that think that, you know, what I'm doing is everything from important to being admirable. You know, when you know, I I appreciate that because it it just gives me the confidence to continue it. Thanks for that, Richard. Uh, moving on, I, I wanted to ask, obviously you have a, a very strong um, community, strong community base in Derry. I also wanted to ask, did you feel the need to seek out other people who had lost their sight? Because maybe even though your friends are there for you and they want to listen, that maybe you still needed or you felt that you wanted to exchange with people who are in a, a very similar position? No, you know what? I was the complete opposite. Okay. That's the truth. And I, I sometimes think about that still. When I lost my sight, truth be told, the last thing I wanted to I, I, I the last thing I wanted was to be seen as a blind person. Hmm. And the last thing I wanted was to be mixing in the circles of other people who are blind. Now, I say that, you know, and I'm ashamed of it. But, like, I, I think that I was worried about being categorized. And where does that come from in a 10-year-old boy? I don't know where that comes from in a 10-year-old boy, being honest. Like, it was at some kind of misguided understanding of, disability or whatever I, I I don't know but all as I knew was people aren't going to see me as a blind person I'm not going to be treated as a blind person I don't want to be that person I want to hang around with the people that hang around me normally I want to do the things as much as I can that I normally did and and I didn't want to feel that I was being farmed off into some kind of institutionalized life and I resisted that tooth and nail. Now, I cannot explain to you where that came from. I think that it was one of my biggest strengths, but I would acknowledge that it was also a weakness. Obviously, as you get older and you're, you're, you you're start to think a bit more as an adult, then you begin to realize that that's a silly way to behave, really, and uh, that, that you begin to... Um, you know, and I, I there's a lot of people that I know and I, I'm friendly with now and then who have disabilities that just completely and utterly inspire me. And, um, you know, and, and, and that's the truth of the matter. I remember there's a guy in Derry here who was blind, a well-known blind guy in Derry called Ronnie Williamson, who passed away many years ago. But Ronnie was a guitar player and sang around the local pubs and, you know, he was a guy that really dealt with blindness very comfortably, as far as I could see. And um, I used to look up to Ronnie. And he used to quietly learn from Ronnie. And like, I learned the guitar and played in bands and stuff like that. And So, 
in many ways, um, there's similarities with the direction my life took from Ronnie's or to, or to Ronnie's. And, uh, you know, there's, there's similarity there. And, uh, you know, so in that regard, you know, but in the early days, I wouldn't carry a white stick, for example. Now, I remember them coming to give me a white stick and I wouldn't use it. Because for me, and this is a 10 or 11 year old boy saying, if I take a white stick, people are going to see me as a blind person. I'm carrying a statement. I am blind. And I don't want people to see me like that. So what did I do? I used the end of a fishing rod. Now, what would look more out of place? <laughs> like, what would look more out of place walking around Craig and tapping a fishing rod or tapping a white stick? <laughs> So, uh, but that's just that sort of warped way of thinking. And But, you know, it probably was a thranness and a strength that helped me at a point in time when I just needed to be like that. But, I, and then as I got older, I began to sort of relax into blindness and realize that it's, you know, that being blind is not such a terrible thing, really. And I shouldn't be ashamed of it. I shouldn't be difficult about other people. Who have a disability, and you know, it's you know, it soon left me. But I just, I, I still wonder how the hell I ended up feeling the like that. Rod. Yeah, the fact I was fishing. <laughs> Maybe I was just fishing. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> so. Richard. Yeah, that, that that's really interesting. Um, yeah. I, I I know you're busy. I, I wanted to ask you also about the work with uh, children in Crossfire. Um, I guess, yeah, I wanted to know, you, you mentioned that you're working in Ethiopia and Tanzania, but I guess how has your work helped you develop over the last 15 years, like personally, like has it really expanded your previous perceptions and and what's the hopes for the future? I God, I mean, I never anticipated Children in Crossfire would grow the way it grew and all that sort of stuff. I had a real passion uh, to just make a difference in the world and use my experience, uh, the positive things about my experience, to hopefully help others. And um, and when I started the charity, I never I knew very much about the development sector really the international development sector is what we call it i didn't know very much about it really and uh as the organization developed and grew i i began to learn very quickly um and um so i mean i it's been the last 24 25 years have been the most rewarding years of my life really and you know i wouldn't want to be anywhere else i wouldn't want to do anything else um but, and, and, you know, I think that, you know, um, when you get up every morning and you're part of a team that bring about change in the world for some people, uh, then it's a very rewarding thing to do. And, you know, I always say that you know, if there's a child in Ethiopia or Tanzania today having access to food, water, or education, it's not because of me. It's not even because of children in Crossfire. But it's because of those people in my life that showed me compassion. Mm. And that's very, that's very important for me. Because... The person I am, the work that I do, has been, without a shadow of a doubt, influenced by the fact that I was shot and blinded by a rubber bullet. But not so much being shot and blinded, but the response to being shot and blinded. Now, the important part about my story is not really being shot. It's what happened from the moment I was shot. That's the important part about my story. And to me, that's where all the lessons are. And like, as I say, because of my parents and their influence, because of the 
the way that my teachers and my friends responded to me because of the help that I received throughout my life, even today. What happened? A Children in Crossfire evolved. And it's an organization that is impacting positively on the lives of children elsewhere in the world. So I certainly can't take the credit for that. It's the people that showed me what real compassion was, what the potential was, and how you can respond to a situation that is potentially traumatic and tragic to use it in a positive way. So, I mean, that's that uh, genuinely who I, I feel about it, you know? It's fantastic. Th- thanks, Richard. Yeah, it's really a, appreciate that. Beautiful, oh, no beautiful problem. message, Richard. Before before we let you go, we always just do one little thing at the end of the podcast to try and help anyone who may be listening, and that's to ask um, the guest for their tips um, and how they keep uh, their mental health in check. So I was wondering, from such an inspirational person like yourself, if there was a if there are any little um, nuggets that you could uh, share with us, so maybe we could also find ourselves on the path that you are now. I. Um, I mean, I think what's worked for me is taking control of your own life, taking control of your own thoughts. And, you know, um, don't always rely on other people. Rely on yourself but rely on the good things within yourself. In a physical way, like I said, when lockdown happened and I was presented with a different challenge, I introduced routine into my life. That was important for me. I got up in the morning and done 30 minutes on a treadmill. There was mornings I could have lay on and not bothered doing that. But every day of lockdown, I done 30 minutes on the treadmill in the morning. Then I made my breakfast. Then I sat down to work. Then I went to walk at lunchtime. Then I worked. And then I went to walk after lunch or after work. Why? To keep myself mentally right. I find walking a brilliant therapy, first of all. And the other thing is, you know, I suppose in a, in, a, in a bigger way, I think that you can improve your own sense of well-being, improve your own sense of happiness by helping others. Like you've often heard the phrase, you know, in every act of generosity, there's an element of selfishness. And there is. I feel good when I do something good. But the Dalai Lama would call that good selfish. So there's good selfish and there's bad selfish. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. So if you can go and help somebody, if you can do a kind act, then if you're feeling good about yourself, Why not do more of it? Why not feel good about yourself? Why not do things that make you feel good? And um, that's all that I would advise people. For me, what has worked for me is I have, I accept the fact in life that you're going to meet challenges. Look, I'm blind for the rest of my life. There's nothing I can do about that. If I focus on what my blindness won't allow me to do, then I'm going to be a very unhappy person. For example, I can't see my children. That's one of the hardest things for me in my life, that I can't see my children. 
If anything would make me cry, that would make me cry. And it does make me cry very often when I can't see my children. I grew up my whole life without seeing my children's faces, without seeing their smiles and all that sort of stuff. But if I focus only on that thought, then I'm going to be a very unhappy person. But what I can do is I can take my children for a walk. I can sit and watch the television with them. I can tell them stories. I can tickle them. I can throw them up and down. I can bounce them on the sofa. I can do all sorts of fantastic things with my children. So instead of me focusing on the fact that I can't see them, I focus on the fact, on the things that I can do with them. I love playing football. As a child, I was football crazy. If I focused on the fact that I couldn't play football anymore, I'd be a very unhappy person. Every person listening to this podcast will have things in their life that frustrate them, that make them unhappy, or they just can't be good at. Don't worry about it. Forget about it. Just navigate around it. Play to your strengths, not your weaknesses. Focus on your ability, not your disability. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. If you can't do it, forget about it, ditch it. That's the only thing that I can say to you that's worked for me. Beautiful. Yeah, that's very profound. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. That's great. No. <laughs> hope, you get, <laughs> hope you get something out of all that. No, uh, no, no. Oh, more than plenty. More than plenty. <laughs> oh, no, I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, and it's, it's, as always, it's, um, whether you realise it or not, when you ask somebody to participate in something like this, it makes them feel important. And uh, you've made me feel important today, and I, I really appreciate it. Oh, absolute pleasure. Uh, you, very inspirational, for yeah. us, Richard. And we're very happy that you agreed to do to to give us your time. So it, it it's mutually. Uh, good selfishness here yeah oh, exactly that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's good uh, brilliant All brilliant right. well thank you very much Richard for coming on like like Jim said I mean we have great guests on this podcast but your message and your story is truly inspirational so thank you so much for your time it's been an, a, a real honour um, to be able to speak to you um, and hopefully uh, not only the listeners but even Jim and I can take something away from from this uh, interview because I, I think it's one to one to definitely look out for and one to bear in mind when we're going through our own troubles in life so I just want to thank you so much for for your message and and for taking the time to speak with us Richard it's a real pleasure thank you thank you Richard thanks so much hi guys thank you for listening to the podcast please don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review if you haven't already Every review helps us climb the podcast charts so that even more of you can listen to our amazing guests. We really appreciate the support. Remember to tune in next week, but until then, keep safe and have a good one.